I hope you'll join us for our latest episode of OMG Omics, where you might find that there's a little bit of a dose of philosophy intertwined with the science here today. Please listen in to hear from Nikolai Slava. Hi, Nikolai. Thanks so much for being here to join us for the OMG Genomics podcast series. It's my pleasure. As with so many of our guests that have achieved career success, you have a varied background. I was hoping that you could tell us more about how you got to where you are in your academic career and with your spin-out institute that takes up so much of your time. I grew up in Bulgaria, and very early on, it was clear to me that uh, there are a lot of exciting things in the world. I was a very curious boy, and my first passion was math and physics, and gradually that transitioned into chemistry, which was the highlight of my high school days. I got to compete in many scientific competitions, uh, math, physics, and chemistry was my strongest subject. I went to the International Chemistry Olympiad, which, which was a wonderful event for me a couple of times. Once I went to Melbourne, Australia, and the second time in Bangkok, Thailand. And as I exchanged ideas and perspectives with other students at the competition, they told me about the possibility to pursue education and research in the US. And in particular, they emphasize that um, having a medal from this competition helps very much to receive uh, full financial support. And I kept that in mind, started my uh, undergraduate education in Sofia University in Bulgaria, in part because I really wanted to experience what it is to be a student there. I had heard wonderful things from my parents, but after one year there, as wonderful as it was, and a year of personal growth, I decided to explore that knowledge that I learned from the Olympiad, that I can pursue education in the U.S. I applied and was accepted by MIT, which very generously provided full financial support for my education. And I had a wonderful time at MIT. I still remember very fondly the many evenings that I spent with my fellow students discussing philosophy questions or discussing the feasibility of nuclear fusion. And still remember very well an undergraduate student who was telling me how he read uh, Principia uh, uh, over the summer before attending MIT. So it was really a great time for me. Um, I had many excellent professors and still remember some of their lectures. And after MIT, I moved on to Princeton, where I did my PhD with David Botstein. My doctoral work was focused on studying metabolism and how that's coordinated with cell growth. And the primary tool that we used at the time as a technology was DNA microarrays that was cutting edge back in the days. Uh, and I very much enjoyed it. Uh, my PhD days were also a time when I had opportunities to explore very broadly different subjects. I always tried to attend the high table, which brought students from different departments, oftentimes comparative literature or astronomy. And they had many conversations with them about the exciting topics in their studies and told them about what I was doing. I had a lot of freedom as a PhD student to explore different corners of the intellectual pursuits of knowledge, spend some time in Sweden and Ireland, uh, really a wonderful six months in University College Dublin where I worked with a theoretical physicist and learned more about the mathematical modeling of phase transitions, Um, learned more about Irish culture and experienced, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, very interestingly being, uh, again, part of the international student body, but now American students were also part of the international student body. So this was an interesting uh, swap of tables. And after my PhD, I came back to Boston to um, pursue postdoctoral research at MIT, um, which was very much inspired from discoveries from my PhD work. I was following, following up our observations, and some of our data indicated that 
the primary mechanism of regulation was at the level of RNA translation or protein synthesis. And I wanted to follow up this, explore it in more details, and consider uh, either using ribosome profiling to measure ribosome density or quantifying proteins with mass spectrometry. At the time, I did not know about mass spectrometry proteomics. And it seemed to me that mass spectrometry proteomics is preferable as being the more direct method, actually measuring proteins rather than ribosome density. Uh, and in particular, I was rather worried that I did not know if ribosomes move or not, and what is the rate at which they would be moving along the messenger RNA. And this would leave a substantial confounding uncertainty in the interpretation of the data. So I started learning about mass spectrometry proteomics, and I loved it. I had two initial impressions, you remember very well. The first one was how cool the technology is and how I wanted to understand more of the physics underpinning the analysis. And the second one was how much exciting potential there is for mass spectrometry proteomics in the life sciences that at the time I felt wasn't utilized completely because many people like myself until not so far ago are simply not aware of uh, the capabilities of that technology. So I felt that I have the potential to accelerate uh, some of these biomedical discoveries that could be enabled by the technology if I um, engage in that part, if, if I start using the mass spectrometry proteomics more actively in my research. And that was really a segue in my career where I transitioned more towards um, um, mass spectrometry proteomics and started becoming expert in the field, which led to me starting my tenure track position at Northeastern University, uh, where I was focused on studying mechanisms of translational regulation, what is commonly known as translation control in the field. Uh, mass spectrometry proteomics was going to be a substantial part of um, our toolkit, but at the same time, I had the rather unorthodox idea that mass spectrometry proteomics should have su sufficient sensitivity to quantify many proteins in single human cells. I didn't pitch that at the time when I applied for either funding or positions because uh, many of the established leaders in the field considered this impossible out of the question. And my background wasn't the ideal background to bring this about anyway, so it didn't make for a great proposal. But nonetheless, as I started my position as um, a faculty at Northeastern University, I had the opportunity to start exploring some of the feasibility of uh, doing this analysis. And in particular, we came up with a strategy now known as isobaric carriers that should make the analysis more robust and uh, give us uh, uh, enhanced ability to sequence amino acid sequences with one to two orders of magnitude higher sensitivity. And that worked wonderfully from the very beginning. I say wonderfully, not because the results initially were all glorious and amazing. No, they weren't. But they, they it was very clear that there is strong signal of the kind that we expected. And it was very clear to us that what we were doing was suboptimal and has potential to be enhanced substantially. And that made it very exciting. We were this small group, mostly undergraduate students. I did not even have instruments at Northeastern, but nonetheless, we were trying to do what our senior colleagues believed impossible and we were succeeding. So that was very, uh, very exciting time and progress was quick. Uh, the support and the excitement of the external community also came without delay and that uh, provided a lot of encouragement for me to continue developing in, in this direction. Thank you so much for that introduction into all of the different things that you've seen. I think that you have, as many of our guests have, varied training, varied interests, and you've been able to take all of that and build a career out of it. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about your spin-out company and institute that you've been working on more recently and how that plays into the academic side and role? Um, we recently established a nonprofit research institute, Parallel Squared Technology Institute, which in many ways conceptually is an extension, an embodiment of that early realization of mine that mass spectrometry proteomics has tremendous potential in biomedical research if we're able to untap it. And I look at this institute as an opportunity to untap this potential at a larger scale, faster than what would be done in an academic environment. Uh, the institute came about from conversations with Schmidt Futures. They approached us, uh, having noticed our work in single cell protein analysis by mass spectrometry, with interest whether we think uh, it's feasible to substantially accelerate the technology development in this space if we had more resources. And resources generally have not been my competitive advantage. I grew up quite in quite modest environment as a student, and I just told you how we did not even have a mass spec instrument when we started doing single cell mass spec proteomics. But they certainly have learned uh, and came to come to appreciate the importance of resources, especially you know, strong teams of colleagues uh, whom we can support financially in cutting edge instrumentation. And I did indeed think that we would be able to make very good uh, use of increased resources from Schmidt Features. And as I shared this possibility with my team at Northeastern, a couple of senior PhD students at the time who were getting ready to graduate expressed very strong interest to be part of the institute. And therefore, we pursued this opportunity. We wrote a detailed proposal where we focus not only on the technology development, which is an important aspect, the technology development being we want to increase the throughput of the technology, make it much more scalable and much cheaper, while at the same time preserving quantitative accuracy, specificity, precision. For me, preserving quality is, or enhancing quality is more important than simply increasing throughput, but we want to accomplish both. Uh, achieve very high quality data while at the same time make them more accessible, cheaper, higher throughput. Uh, but in addition to that technology core of the Institute, we have uh, a strong focus on biological applications. And in particular, we are focusing on uh, studying the etiology of Alzheimer's disease. It's a very important pathology with a huge human impact that is poorly understood. We know that protein pathologies are very central to Alzheimer's disease, but nonetheless, um, many of the studies continue to focus on analyzing nucleic acids because this is more accessible to uh, very many investigators. And we think that bringing to bear the capabilities of mass spectrometry proteomics can, can make important contributions in, in this area. And another biological direction in parallel squared is studying how our immune cells, B cells, T cells, monocyte change with human aging and in response to various pathophysiological conditions. And we expect that um, these biological directions so will continue to expand. Uh, we certainly appreciate the potential of our technology to contribute to cancer as well, though at the moment that's not yet a very active focus because we want to have enough focus early on to make significant headway before we expand. So it's an early stage research institute and I enjoy being part of it and leading it very much. We already have an enthusiastic group of uh, scientists and researchers um, who are making wonderful progress. So I have some more questions here. Um, you know, now that you have the resources to do this at scale, 
what are the challenges in order to actually get usable data and information? How much analysis do you have to do? How are you storing your data and and compensating for the massive amounts of information that are coming in? Certainly acquiring data does not equal answering questions or understanding scientific systems, biological systems. Um, A very important component to have a chance to interpret the data is to think hard about experimental design. What experiments we should do to maximize data interpretation, how we can collect not only molecular measurements, but rich physiological annotations, metadata describing um, the various phenotypes of of patients, their pathophysiology, clinical profiles. Um, How can we acquire the data in such a way that um, interpretation is not confounded by technical artifacts? There are quite a few high-profile examples of this in the literature where all of the samples from one species were analyzed in one batch and all of the samples from another species in another batch. And as a consequence, any difference that we observe could either be due to species difference or batch difference, and it's impossible to disentangle that. So uh, starting with the right experimental design is, is important. And then... Sometimes the interpretation is focusing on specific hypotheses that we had to begin with. And sometimes it's focused on exploring the data, especially the omics data that we uh, obtain, uh, with open mind to look for new trends and new surprises, and then thinking of follow-up experiments, how we can test different hypotheses that can explain what we have observed. Um, and taking it from there. So I think it's a very creative process. It doesn't have a single prescription. Uh, that's something that one learns with experience um, and having different perspectives, different colleagues who look at the data can certainly help with that. And people can see it from different angles. And of course, as, as we are discussing all of this, it's not something that I do alone. I do with my team. And... Um, Working very well with a strong team is one of the biggest challenges. I think that uh, scientific expertise and creativity is a very, very precious resource. Um, And assembling the right team, stimulating people, encouraging them to be bold, not only to answer the prescribed questions that have been set from the outside, but also to aspire to go beyond that, to aspire to to imagine what could be, and go and explore. A lot of times that might lead to failure, and that's okay, but unless we really try and push the boundaries, we are not going to achieve greatness. So I think an important part of my task is to motivate my colleagues, my teammates to be bold uh, in their explorations and to couple that boldness with scientific rigor. Because if one is only bold, you can end up confusing people and making fool of yourself of claiming something that is half-baked and uh, incorrect. But I think the combination of courage and boldness with scientific rigor and willingness to scrutinize very, very rigorously your hypothesis and subject them to different kinds of tests is is the path to make significant discoveries. So let's go back to PTI. I think you've given us a really good picture of how you got to this point, the mission, and how it plays into single cell space. But maybe you can tell us a little more specifically how mass spectrometry has influenced single cell and what you think some of the continuing breakthroughs might be with regards to that. I think when people think of mass spectrometry proteomics for single cell analysis, perhaps on the top of their list is going to be the motivation of having a deeper proteome coverage. Instead of analyzing um, a few dozen or a few hundred proteins, um, analyzing thousands, 
And that, imp- and that, of course, is an important motivation. But for me personally, probably more important is the specificity of quantification. Before mass spectrometry proteomics, single cell protein analysis was done with affinity reagents. And those affinity reagents detect a single epitope. They do not quantify a protein. They detect an epitope that might be present in many different protein forms. But in addition to that epitope, they may bind many other epitopes non-specifically. And even if they have high specificity for their cognate epitope, if it's slowly abundant, there is a high probability, simply by mass action, that those affinity regions are going to bind some other more highly abundant proteins and give um, non-specific background, which contaminates uh, quantification. And that problem is difficult to detect. So oftentimes when people read out signals um, for epitopes detected with affinity reagents, the signals are going to be superposition of specific and non-specific binding with no indication of how much of that signal is specific. And to me, that's a very substantial limitation of other approaches. Mass spectrometry, of course, by virtue of the very high resolution in MO resist space, in chromatographic space, in eye mobility space, in detecting precursors, peptide fragments, is able to achieve very high specificity. Uh, and that's, in my mind, a very significant advantage. And of course, that is coupled with the ability to detect many thousands of proteins. And we have seen a very rapid increase in the coverage of the proteomes of single cells. And some of those have been driven by new experimental concepts for data acquisition and data interpretation. And some of those are driven by new instrumentation with companies uh, making new and more sensitive instruments A great example for that is the um, increased um, efficiency of uh, iron delivery by uh, Team Stuff Instruments and iron mobility, which plays very nicely, trapped iron mobility with accumulating more ions and achieving higher sensitivity. So all of these different factors are combining together to substantially increase depth of um, protein coverage. And what I'm most excited about going forward really is using those measurements to answer biological questions. That was the motivation to begin with. I shouldn't forget that. So I've spent a lot of time in technology development and I continue to do that. There are certainly important frontiers there and and big opportunities to continue improving depth and sensitivity. Uh, But we are very eager to answer biological questions. And we've already seen a lot of examples of that from my lab at Northeastern University where we are able to meaningfully interpret uh, protein co-variation within a single time point. For example, when looking at uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, we see that there is substantial heterogeneity of cells along this path, and that's not surprising, that's not new. But what's really interesting is that if we look at any one particular time point of that process, we can quantify protein covariation, protein-protein correlations that are dynamically evolving, and they indicate of how protein interactions and signaling pathways are changing in these cells in a way that we could never have inferred from just measuring protein abundances uh, in these cells. Uh, the other examples is measuring proteolytic activities of macrophages as they get polarized to, to different states, where we not only can detect the polarization by measuring proteins, but by measuring some of the activated caspases, we can start to understand what are the signaling pathways participating in that polarization. So there are increasing number of, of those examples where uh, mass spectrometry proteomics is in a unique position to answer 
biomedical questions and not only being in that position, but delivering on the promise and beginning to, to deliver answers. Nicola, if you're familiar with this podcast at all, you know I have a stock question that I go through and I ask everybody. So I hope you're prepared and that you can tell us about your OMG moment that helped you into science. You shared some of your your early experiences and what got you to getting your degrees, but is there anything else that really has hit you throughout your career that just made you go, wow, I am so amazed that I get to do these things? There are so many moments. It is difficult to choose a single one to single it out. But one moment that comes to mind is when for the first time I understood how calculus could be used to derive some of the very simple thermodynamical equations that I had read as a student and I admired greatly. And it seemed to me that the people who came up with these equations are some sort of gods. And I I admired how these very simple equations could explain so much, but they had no understanding of how people came up with those. And after I saw the derivation of some of these equations using simple calculus, using simple intuitive principles, I I felt very much empowered. It it, it was a wonderful feeling uh, that, that they still recall. So I imagine that means you have strong feelings about the mathematical underpinnings and what PhD students should be taking in their coursework. I think math- mathematics is absolutely beautiful and helps one develop rigorous thinking. I certainly don't seek to inf- to enforce upon people uh, my beliefs, but I certainly see good understanding of math and data analysis as being incredibly useful and powerful these days, especially given the size and complexity of data sets that we acquire. It is very difficult to imagine making sense of those data sets without using sophisticated computational tools. And I do feel very strongly that PhD students should understand how the algorithms that they use work, at least at conceptual level. If they seek to be technicians, they can be very useful technicians uh, without having that understanding. But to me, that's one of the important dimensions that separates uh, a scientist who aspires to be a principal investigator and to be a scientific leader from somebody who is merely running some pipelines to get some data. It's the understanding of what's going on and the awareness of what one understands and can be confident in and what one gets as a result but doesn't understand and should not have confidence in in, in it. Those are very diplomatic and yet still strongly emotional argument. Um, that That was a really nice answer, Nikolai. I've got a couple more questions for you. We're getting near to wrapping up here. Um, But from our conversations, I can tell that your personal philosophy is that science does not exist in a discipline vacuum. You have to take from all of the aspects that you encounter and draw the benefits and bring them together. I'm wondering if you have any other personal stories, maybe centered around philosophy um, and your own personal interests that have influenced you or maybe just a great moment you've had with someone else. I'm not sure to what extent what I'm going to say is a direct response to your question, but one thing that comes to mind is my experience and conviction that one doesn't need to have access to the best resources to make meaningful contributions. I sometimes see young scientists being discouraged because they see that others are in a better, more advantageous position. They're in a wealthier lab, have access to more technology, better equipment. And as somebody who has occupied that spot for a long time, I've seen others have access to more resources. I never felt discouraged by that. I felt stimulated that I'm going to use whatever I have, whatever my constraints are, and see if I can do something of interest to contribute. And This attitude has certainly helped me tremendously throughout the years. 
And that's something that I try to share more broadly with students because I think it can be very empowering for students who don't happen to be privileged, who don't come from wealthy backgrounds and wealthy families. I think it's important to realize the diversity of contributions that we can make and to place a lot of emphasis on our own intellectual contributions. Because sometimes the result can be remarkable because we had access to the best equipment and we could acquire the most data. And that's a milestone of sorts, and that's okay. But sometimes the result is remarkable because we saw things differently. We had an idea that something that others believed impossible might be possible. And we go about and rigorously explore the feasibility of that idea and bring it about to uh, to the surface. And I think that second kind of contribution is no less important and certainly holds a special place in, in my heart and my mind. And I think this kind of contributions are important and I would like to encourage all younger students who feel that they're not in a privileged contribution to not be discouraged from that, but nonetheless ask what could be their intellectual contributions, regardless of the resources that they have at their disposal. So my last question for you today, Nikolai, is you've mentioned several times how you can't do this alone and how a team is such a strong part of how you've gotten to where you are. So are there any shout outs that you'd like to give, any specific names you want to drop, say thank you to, or anything to that effect? Oh, that is such a difficult question because <laughs> the names are too many. And if oh, I so have you need to scroll through to have everybody. Right. <laughs> so if there is a danger that I mention some people, but not other people. So without... Um, without claims of mentioning all of the important people in, in my career, I'll mention a few of those. Um, I, I have wonderful memories from my chemistry teacher in high school. Uh, she was one of the early people who encouraged me and she did not work so much one on one with me, but she provided, um, examples of previous problems given at the scientific competitions and was supportive of me going to these competitions. And uh, by doing that, she certainly made a big difference to me and I, I still remember her fondly. I had a very important mentoring interaction with a professor in Ireland during the time of my PhD. As I mentioned, they spent six months in University College Dublin where I worked with Professor Kenneth Dawson. And he spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with me discussing various scientific and philosophical subjects to a degree that I had not experienced before. And I've always attributed to his uh, education in the English system, I believe, in Oxford, that focuses a lot on one-on-one -on -one mentoring interactions. And I remember learning many things from him, including um, how to very carefully and rigorously read a paper and how to distinguish knowing from not knowing something. And he also was a personal mentor in some ways, as before that point, I had um, had very limited budgets. I never, ever went to a restaurant. I consider that inacceptable way of spending money because my budgets were so constrained. And he took me out to nice restaurants. And because I had such a high regard of him, I considered that going out to a restaurant maybe not a bad thing. And in, in that way, that opened up a little bit my perspectives in from a personal perspective. Now, this seems almost embarrassing to admit, but it is true. It It is the path that my life took. And uh, in that way, he, he played an important role. Um, I certainly learned a great deal from my PhD mentor, David Botstein. He, he is somebody who many would describe as being um, strong-willed, maybe abrasive, but I always 
found as somebody who is a great scientist, very critical, very quick to think of counter arguments. And uh, I appreciated his direct feedback. Uh, his style was really quite um, formative for me. Um, and then, of course, many of my early PhD students in my lab at Northeastern have um, contributed much to the success of my independent career. Um, in particular, I've had um, wonderful experiences working with uh, Harrison Speck and uh, Andrew LeDuc and, and many, many other people from, from my group at Northeastern. So the people whom I would like to mention are many more than I have time to mention in this podcast. So I'll finish again with a disclosure that the, <laughs> the list that I, I gave is very incomplete. There are certainly many more people whom I would like to acknowledge for having helped me in various ways throughout the years. I can tell how genuine that is and that your your precision with making sure that all people are acknowledged is is real. So thank you for all of the personal stories and, and telling us about your journey. Um, it's been great to talk with you and, and I hope to be able to showcase your career again at some point. It's been a busy year so far with OMG OMX. I hope you've been enjoying and that you'll continue to tune in for our remaining three episodes with additional scientists. Thanks. <laughs>